from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This is the Bob Harrington Show. Dr. Robert Harrington is the Arthur L. Professor and Chair of Medicine at Stanford University. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape. Hi, I'm Bob Harrington from Stanford University. I'm here in Barcelona at the European Society of Cardiology meetings. And first I have to say, wow, it's fantastic to be back at a uh, live face-to-face meeting, getting to see friends and colleagues from around the globe, in addition to hearing about great science. While here, I'm having the opportunity to talk with a good friend and colleague, Dr. John Pacini. John, welcome. Thanks, Bob, it's great to be here. John is a Associate Professor of Medicine at Duke University where he's also the director of electrophysiology. And that's exactly why I have you here, John, is that I want to pick your brain a bit. That, uh, you know, as we were talking before we came online here, um, I'm from the affirm generation in the management of atrial fibrillation. That if people, if you can get rate control and symptoms are good, you leave them with rate control. Yeah. Uh, You're from more of the, I'll call it the East AF generation, where maybe the first instinct should be to try to get you back in sinus rhythm. Obviously, a lot of data has been accumulated, clinical data, physiologic data about the function of the heart, including the atria, yeah. um, longer term outcome data. And you're now doing a trial. Yes. So let, let's maybe start me back with a firm yeah. and start walking through what we've been learning along the way. And how do you as both a clinical electrophysiologist, but also an academic trialist, how are you thinking about the big questions? Yeah. Oh, well, you know, I'm an electrophysiologist, but I think one of the really important things is um, most people in cardiovascular medicine know AFib is not rare. <laughs> we tend to right. see a lot of it. So these are I'm questions. a general cardiologist now, <laughs> no longer an interventionalist, but I see a lot of atrial fibrillation. Right. Yeah. So, you know, the, the trial and this discussion of rate versus rhythm and then early rhythm control is important for all cardiovascular medicine specialists. And I'd argue internal medicine specialists, emergency medicine specialists. So you alluded to these Vanguard rate versus rhythm control trials, which showed no difference between the two strategies. And I think there's two really things people need to understand. One, our, our therapies in addition to rate and rhythm control weren't so great back during the times right. of those clinical trials. Not everyone was anticoagulated, uh, like in the more recent clinical trials. And then our methods of rhythm control were suboptimal would be kind, uh, you know, largely amiodarone in many, many cases, which we know is a toxic medication in the long term. Now we've had more recent clinical trials and EAST is probably the, the most important of those, which shows that if you initiate early rhythm control within one year of diagnosis, you can improve hard cardiovascular endpoints in the context of good care, including stroke prevention mm-hmm. therapy. And, sure. and in a reasonably sized trial, it's not a was not a tiny trial. In a reasonably sized trial. And I think the other thing that's important is the mean age was 70. So we're not, you know, we're not talking about just young patients. We're talking about patients, um, you know, who have comorbidities and other diagnoses. And and that showed an improvement in outcomes. But what is a very common dilemma for clinicians is the patient who comes in with a new diagnosis of AFib. Yes, you're going to prevent the patient, uh, protect the patient against stroke. You're going to make sure they're not tachycardic. What do you do after that? And one in five patients who presents to an acute care facility with AFib indeed has new onset AFib. And there's no evidence to guide that decision whether you should rate or rhythm control them. And if you look in US practice, it's a coin toss. About half of doctors do one thing, half of doctors do the other. Let me ask you, is it age related? In other words, are the clinicians of my generation more likely to go for rate control because of a firm? And are the clinicians in your generation a little more aggressive? I, I think uh, we don't, uh, we've not studied that specific question in a scientific format, but certainly surveys and conversations and uh, engagement mm-hmm. groups indicate that. But so to get at this question, what do you do with some for yeah. new diagnosis? We're doing the change AFib trial, which is going to test the hypothesis that if you introduce early rhythm control with a well tolerated anarrhythmic drug, in this case, trinetarone, uh, versus usual care, do you decrease the risk? of cardiovascular hospitalization and death at one year. So big population, I'm assuming you're studying a lot of patients. 3,000. So good good sample size, pretty important clinical outcomes. Let's talk about those clinical outcomes because I made reference to the fact that there's a lot of not just clinical data, but I'll call it physiologic data. People look at the function of the atrium. People look at the function, you know, if, if, does it cause LV dysfunction? Certainly we know the prolonged tachycardia does. 
What do we know and what, what happens to the heart with prolonged AF or, or a flutter? Yeah, so we talk about asymptomatic atrial fibrillation all the time, but it's really interesting when you look at the physiologic data you're alluding to, yeah. it's often very difficult to identify asymptomatic atrial fibrillation. VO2 max goes down, cardiac output gets diminished, all of these things. I should have mentioned probably very early that Change AFib is a pragmatic clinical trial. So we're going to be focused on patient-reported outcomes, yep. cardiovascular endpoints. We're also going to be looking at some measures of physiology, which are really longer-term measures like progression of atrial fibrillation, who needs escalation of medical therapy, who gets a new diagnosis of heart failure. And you're going to do it in, in full disclosure because I'm uh, associated with the Heart Association yes. in various roles. This is being done in collaboration with the Heart Association because you're using, as I understand it, the backbone of Get With The Guidelines. Yes. And, and I think this is, to be honest, is one of the most exciting parts of the trial is the reg the trial will be embedded in the Get With The Guidelines Quality Improvement Program and Registry. And I think that's really significant because, as you know, Get With The Guidelines has, for example, improved stroke prevention to over 95% of patients with atrial fibrillation. And now we're trying to conduct a clinical trial in the registry more effectively, get to pragmatic answers that clinicians in the trenches need in a more facile fashion. So hopefully this will be the first of many yeah. pragmatic clinical trials. Well, as you know, I, I've wanted for years to, uh, to make clinical trials simpler, more efficient. And I've always thought of the registry backbone as a way to facilitate that. The challenge has always been that maybe the way the data was collected, maybe the day, the way the data streamed in to the registry wasn't going to be suitable for um, clinical trials, but now it is. Yes, and, and we're doing everything we can to make follow-up easy as well. So someone doesn't have to necessarily see their EP doctor for an AFib-specific visit for right. us to collect outcomes. So we're, we, we've done a variety of these things because we want to get to the question, answer to the question as quickly as we can. Yeah, and then once we do that, I do agree with you, this then can become a substrate to do a lot of other kind of clinical trials which, you know, one of the things I like about this trial is it's a strategy trial. It's not comparing drug A versus drug B. I mean, there that's is right. a drug in it, but that's really not the question. We know that dronetarone, as you said, is an effective antiarrhythmic agent. What we're really trying to figure out is the initiation of dronetarone when versus not doing it. How does ablation fit into it? Like, is that available in both arms? Is that only in the dronetarone yeah. arm? So as you mentioned, it really is a strategy trial of upfront dronetarone versus usual care. And so patients in either arm, if they develop worsening symptoms or more recurrent atrial fibrillation, the investigator says, I think this patient requires an ablation. That is completely part of the trial. We have some hypotheses about what we think controlling the atrial fibrillation early will do to need for downstream therapy. What's your hypothesis? Um, I, I think there is a lot of data to support the concept that if you intervene in atrial fibrillation early, you delay disease progression and you will keep the patient optimally healthier for a longer period of time. Progression meaning um, propensity to be an AF? Propensity to be an F, but also uh, propensity for there to be additional ultra, ultra structural changes in the atrium that favor that persistence of atrial fibrillation. You know, you made reference to the anticoagulation issues in a firm, and that became one of the interesting things in a firm, as you remember, that the rhythm control group had less anticoagulation yes. than the rate control group. And surprise, there were more strokes in the, uh, in the rhythm control group, felt to be because of inadequate anticoagulation. We've learned a lot about anticoagulation then, that it's more a function of the patient than the rhythm. Yes. So what are you recommending in, uh, in Change AF about anticoagulation? So um, we're recommending that everyone follow the guidelines. So we largely anticipate we should have near uniform oral anticoagulation because, of course, the vast majority of patients will meet Chad's vast criteria for yeah. oral anticoagulation. And you see it as being equal. You don't think you'll have the a firm problem that people will go into sinus rhythm, but they'll stay on anticoagulation? No, I, I, I think... Um, you know, one trial is one trial, but we've now seen a very reassuring yeah. progression where clinicians know that stroke prevention is important. And at least in the clinical trials, the rates of adherence are, are very a, high. A, a, a very good. Well, let, let's let's move from the trial world. So this is fantastic. I'm glad you're doing this. This is a I, I was telling you before we started that this comes in, up in my clinic every week. I see a patient referred to me with, you know, new AFib and uh, you have that conversation about is it really bothering you? Let's look at what your heart looks like. Let's start anticoagulation if uh, if appropriate, and then let's talk about putting you into sinus rhythm right. versus not. My bias has been to give everybody a chance to go into sinus rhythm. Uh, where I've been less aggressive is how is if you fail staying in sinus rhythm and you're feeling okay, 
do I just leave you an AF? Uh, it's a great question. So first of all, you're one of the cardiologists that taught me that approach and I carry it forward to this day. And as you pointed out, it's, it's not just a treatment, it's a diagnostic test to see if the patient right. feels better. But what if they don't feel better? Um, I think there's, at least I think now there's an increasingly high burden on us to really prove that. And some people use exercise testing. Other folks say, well, we know from East, when you looked at whether they were symptomatic or not, there was no difference in the primary outcome. Yeah. So in those situations, we sit down with the patient and we say, listen, this is the accumulating evidence we have. The East trial tells us that in the long term, you may do better from a cardiovascular health standpoint. We have that conversation. And increasingly, patients say, well, I would like to avoid cardiovascular events in the future. Down the road. And they decide to engage in rhythm control. Last question for you. Atrial flutter versus atrial fib, are we are they included in the study? Are we treating those patients differently? Yes, if someone has isolated atrial flutter, they're not eligible. Okay. Um, but as you know, the two cousins are they go interchangeably yep. linked. So, you know, uh, I would say a good, good majority of the patients with atrial flutter will, will look, still look be for, eligible. Look for the AFib too, because it's likely to be there. That's right, that's right. And, I, and tell me if this is um, lore or backed by data. Uh, the ability of the electrophysiologist to ablate atrial flutter better technically than AF? Yes. I mean, I think it depends on the type of flutter, but I think typical flutter, I, I think there'd be very few arguments that that is a very straightforward situation for a catheter ablation and the patient will have a very good result. And then the trick is providing the anticipatory guidance, taking a term from pediatrics, you know, oh, hey, now your lifetime risk instead of one of four is one and two. And yeah. if you have palpitations, you need to talk to your doctor. Yeah. Good advice. All right, John, this has been a fantastic conversation. Good luck with the trial. Thank you. Show us how to use Get With The Guidelines to do future trials. So we're all really looking forward to this and uh, hope to see you back at one of the big meetings in a few years presenting the results. It'd be great. It's great to be back in person again. This has been Bob Herring and John Pacini here at ESC in Barcelona talking about initial strategy in the treatment of atrial fibrillation. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.